Uh, unit three is a weird unit in the AP, um, partly because it's theoretically the most tested on. It's 18 to 22%, but it's also kind of a unit compiled of subunits. So like last unit was really clear. It was like ba making bonds, like very, very one dimensional theme, very consistent. This unit's like, we're going to look at interaction between molecules and then we're going to look at gases and then we're going to look at solutions and mixtures. And those are all technically focusing on interaction between molecules, but it feels like three separate units in one. All right. So I just want to give you that little preface of it's going to feel funkadunk. All right. We're going to hit up the first thing and just naming the types of interactions that we can find in a molecule once we've built it. All right. Um, your recap of unit two, which you just took a test on, normally you'd have like maybe like a half day or something between. No, no. Uh, ionic covalent metallic. We call those intramolecular forces, by the way. Intramolecular forces are any type of solid bonding of some sort. Like it is an actual electron share or transfer. Actual electron share or transfer. And then um, we also ended a little bit of unit two with molecular polarity. Those two topics right there are going to be um, essential for you understanding this topic that I'm about to introduce. Okay. So, um, intermolecular forces occur, uh, when molecules, I'm just going to say between molecules, let's make it easy between molecules. And so there's no exchange or sharing of electrons. And please grade Maggie's as a priority. We want to see if she can stay. No, don't do that. Um, okay. So what we say is that they're always weaker than intramolecular forces. Your covalent, your ionic, and your metallic bonds. Kind of like, hopefully, the things that hold you together, right? You'd like your intestines, the forces holding your intestines together to be stronger um, than maybe the forces of you holding hands with someone like Red Rover, Red Rover. Have you guys ever played that game, Red Rover, Red Rover, call somebody Red Rover? Okay. Um, I don't think our class ends until two fifteen. Let's take a. So intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are determined by molecular polarity. The polarity of the entire molecule. My hands are shaking. I know mine are kind of too. Molecular. It gets so exciting. Molecular polarity. Chemistry is just so hi. Chemistry is just so exciting, and it determines the physical properties <laughs> the physical properties that's a lot of carbs I'll eat some. the physical properties i said that three times now of substances um for example right uh no let's just leave it it's for, um, for example melting point okay melting point that is the temperature at which a substance goes from a solid to a liquid, right? Obviously. So the higher the IMFs, the higher the interactions between the molecules, okay, the higher the melting point because you need more energy to break or to separate, more energy to separate because we're not really breaking any bonds. We're just separating the molecules. Remember, nothing's actually bonded together. They're just interacting like holding hands, okay? But you're not actually fused together. Okay. Um, okay, boiling point. This is the temp at which a substance transitions from liquid to gas, right? Similar idea. You guys probably can fill in the trend. The higher the IMFs, the higher the boiling point, the more energy to separate, even more, right? You're separating and further, further, further. Okay, this, by the way, this idea that the physical properties of a substance are determined by the polarity or the structure of an atom or a molecule is a really big idea. And it's a big idea because of this. In chemistry, we often explore how structure determines function. Okay, structure determines function. So melting point is a function. Okay, melting point is a function. <laughs> Boiling point would be like a function. When do you boil? When do you melt, right? So here are some other functions that are connected to IMF. Surface tension is 
Okay. It is the resistance. Okay. Of a liquid. Of a liquid surface. And I don't know why I always write my liquids like cursive, but I just do. Of a liquid surface to expansion. So have you ever seen those like little bugs that like float on water? Well, why can bugs float on water? Water has surface tension. Water molecules don't like to separate. They hold on to each other. They're attracted to each other. It's not just about mass. Yes, what's the laughter thing? Oh, the laughter is because the bugs well, that too, but like, but you know, theoretically there's someone in history that walked on water, but the idea is, the idea is, is that, um, <laughs> a little wombat, like boom, boom, boom. Um, but the idea is that your water molecules do have a limit, right? Remember it's a resistance. You can bust through the resistance, just like we could bust through each other's arms in Red Rover, right? But the idea is that the more IMFs you have, right, the greater your interactions are between the particles, the greater your surface tension. So the more likely you're going to be able to, I don't know, float more bugs or have something stay on the surface if you really like to analyze bugs, okay? Viscosity is a kind of a similar concept. This property, this function is, okay, a measurement. of a liquid's resistance to flow. So, um, ketchup. Ketchup is a great example of a highly viscous substance, okay? It has greater IMFs. I have no idea. He did a lot of things. And so therefore it has greater viscosity. Okay. So ketchup being viscous means something about its molecules are a little bit more sticky to one another. They don't love to just spread out. Unlike oil, oil will spread all over you. Okay. Um, alcohol will spread all over you. It's really thin. You spill it, it goes everywhere. Okay. Um, so there are three types of IMFs as far as characteristics of IMFs, or I guess you could say the nature of IMFs, okay? Um, the first is called London dispersion forces, and London dispersion forces are known as LDFs, and they're the weakest type of IMF a molecule can experience with another molecule, okay? And it's the attraction between a covalent, okay, covalent molecules, the, and it occurs when the electron of one atom is attracted to the nucleus of another. This causes a temporary dipole to form, a temporary polarity to form. Uh, so have you guys ever been on the dance floor? And like, let's say all of the people, students dancing on the dance floor are like little electrons, okay? What happens sometimes is you'll notice that as you all dance, right? And you haven't been separated into like girls and boys or anything like that. Like you're just dancing. You'll notice the dance floor shift. Like there's just naturally starts to see a movement due to the random motion of people that suddenly all of a sudden, like half the people on this side and half the people on that side, a temporary dipole has occurred. And what do you do? Oh, there's this unique type of interaction. You start talking to people on the fringes. You attract as a result of your temporary dipole, your temporary movement, you get another group to be attracted and you start talking and you interact. And then you kind of realize, whoa, we shifted all, all that shifted. And then you all shift back to the center again. That's basically what happens with these types of intermolecular forces is they're totally based on the random motion of electrons that somehow the electrons just kind of accidentally find themselves on one side. So there accidentally becomes a temporary moment of instantaneous polarity that creates an instantaneous polarity in somebody else. And then it kind of like all moves back and it starts all over again, okay? So um, we say the more electrons there are, the stronger this force. So this force is a really weak one, but the one way we can strengthen it is strengthened through numbers. So on the AP FRQ, oftentimes what they like to say is they like to have you say it this way. There were more polarizable electron cloud
This comes out often when talking about two molecules that can only do LDFs, why one seems to show a stronger overall force despite having the same type is because one just has more electrons by pure amount of numbers to engage in creating a dipole. They just create a more intense di temporary dipole just because of the mere amount, okay? Um, so for example, uh, CH4 is a gas and CHH18 is a liquid. All CH only compounds are nonpolar. And as a result, they can only have LDFs. But what we see here is despite these three compounds being all nonpolar, okay, you do see an increasing amount of um, intermolecular forces due to simply the compounds getting bigger with more electrons available to create those temporary dipoles. LDFs are experienced by every single molecule out there because every single molecule can have electrons move in them. The LDF is the bare minimum for everybody. What makes it unique is nonpolar can only have LDFs. So for nonpolar, you can only experience LDF. But technically, every molecule has LDFs. It's just that nonpolar are limited to this type. But everybody else also gets it. Okay? So uh, this is an every molecule has it. But for nonpolar, it's the only type nonpolar can experience. So the second type of IMF is, yes, Alok? Uh, what did you say your LDF used for? Uh, what do you mean used for? I didn't like, why do we care about Well, if you don't have molecules that interact with one another, every single molecule out here would break apart and float on its own. So your sample of water would be like in space. It just start molecule by molecule floating apart. You need the interactions. Your DNA is built off of IMFs as well. How it holds your rings together. It, Oh, go, no, go ahead. Yeah, well, water is an example of the highest form of um, IMFs, but technically LDF is just the bare minimum of interaction and molecules need to be in able to interact. So LDF is the, is, it's the tripping bar of interactions. It's like molecules have to be able to interact, interact with each other. So we're calling that minimal interaction L LDFs. You can't not have molecules interact with each other because you don't work with molecules on a per molecule basis. You just don't. That's how the world works. Macroscopically, they have to interact with each other to create large enough samples to interact as a human with. That's the best way I can explain it. It's not the most scientific, but that's my logic for you right now. So the second type is dipole-dipole. And this occurs between polar covalent molecules. So the greater the okay, polarity of the molecule, the greater the force of attraction. So if you have dipole-dipole, what do you also have? If you're a molecule that can also engage in dipole-dipole, what do you also have? LDFs, exactly. So we're just getting more and more specific. You got to think of it like a triangle, like Everybody, okay, Alex, well, here, everybody gets LDFs and then we're upping a level and then only some get dipole, dipole. But if you get to dipole, dipole, you've also met L LDFs. It's like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You can't achieve the next state without having achieved the first. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, by the way, we have a second name we say that if you experience LDFs and dipole-dipole interactions, oh, sorry, I forgot the second dipole. That's like saying you have van der Waal forces. Van der Waal forces. That's equal to saying van der Waal forces. So what van der Waal forces does is it acknowledges the coexistence of the London dispersion. But if you just say dipole-dipole, you're highlighting the unique nature of that molecule. Okay, that's just for point of reference. 
What's really important about dipole dipole is notice the name. It's saying that a dipole, a polar molecule, interacts with another polar molecule. And notice how they're oriented. Opposites attract between the molecules. Your dipole, your separation of charge, your permanent, your permanent polarity in one molecule attracts a permanent polarity in another molecule, and they orient themselves in such a way that it's complementary. Opposites attract. Okay, so this right here would be a dipole-dipole interaction the, between those two, three molecules. Exactly, it's like a magnet. The third type of IMF is called hydrogen bonding. Big emphasis on the fact that we use the word bond, but it's not a real bond. Okay, this is a very special IMF that exists between polar molecules, because of course you can't advance unless you've met everything else. Okay, that have hydrogen connected to an O or hydrogen connected to an F or hydrogen connected to an N in the molecule. These have very high melting and boiling points. Water is the best example, yes. Yep, yep. So water is the best example, H, I'm gonna draw it like this for a second. It's gonna be, well, here, I'll draw it like this. It's gonna be a little funky. Here I have a water molecule, okay? Another water molecule's H will be attracted to another water molecule's O, okay? These is the top of the triangle. This right here, H bonding is the top. Then you got dipole and then you got LDF. This is a special one. You have everything below it as well, but only some can get this. A really good way to remember the bonds between hydrogen that you want is hydrogen likes to phone a friend, F-O-N. Hydrogen phones a friend. Okay, hydrogen likes to phone a friend, F-O-N. So we can also use IMFs to explain states of matter, which you're already kind of putting together in addition. As far as uh, increasing IMF according to states of matter, okay, it goes gas is less than liquid, which is less than solid. Decreasing IMF, right, goes from solid to liquid to gas. Your states of matter are not necessarily equivalent with the types present. You could have a nonpolar LDF-based IMF molecule that's a solid. We would still say it has state of matter-wise high IMFs, but chemically-wise low IMFs. So don't, don't pair them. They're not paired. They're just IMFs in various forms, okay? IMFs in terms of molecular structure and IMFs in terms of solid structure, state of matter. They can overlap, but they are not together. So how do we explain molecular solids? Well, this was the type of solid that molecules can form. And this is when molecules engage in, individual molecules that engage in IMFs so strong, they make a solid. Okay, so strong they make a solid. Okay. Um, one really common place that we see an unique interaction between IMFs and intramolecular bonds where you actually kind of see them overlap is ionic molecules. So, you okay? Yeah. So, normally we can pretty much just separate intramolecular forces and intermolecular forces. The interactions inside holding the molecule versus the interaction between molecules. Yes. Are these intermolecular forces the same forces that like that was, for example, facing the molecule? Like on the macro scale, I am hesitant to say yes because I do not know my geochemistry very well. 
I feel like minerals fall slightly different, but theoretically it's analogous. Um, he's not, <sighs> okay. Uh, it's like the right idea. I just would be hesitant to say it's true because I do not study rocks. And I do think minerals are different. That's inorganic. I'm looking at organic things right now. Molecules, covalently bonded. A person's hand. What do you mean by that? Holding your stuff, your stuff together? Yeah. Theoretically, yeah. Yeah. The molecules that make up your cells or some, they're, they're like, there's an interaction of bonding and then there's an interaction of interactions that together create your solid nature, mostly solid, unless, you know, you eat something weird, but you know. Um, so there is this unique IMF that we call as ion dipole attraction. And you really want to make a note that this is a very unique IMF because it kind of overlaps with intramolecular forces, which we don't normally it's not fun for us because we like to keep things separate, but it's also what makes the world go round, this unique overlap, okay? And so what we see is in water, um, ionic compounds, right, are cations plus anions, okay, arranged in a lattice structure. Okay, in lattice. So basically it's like one giant ionic compound, right? That's basically what ionic solid is, like one giant ionic compound of just repeating anion cation bonding. But what happens is when we drop ionic compound salts in water, what we see is a dissolving or what we call dissociation. Disso, how do I spell this? Dissociation, okay, of the solid. And what we see is before, here's our image, before we have the salt, the ionic compound has intramolecular forces. And the water molecule surrounding it, okay, are demonstrating H bonding, right? And everything else below it. But I'm gonna just feature the main one, H bonding, okay? In IMFs, the standard what we know. What happens is over time as you stir in the particles mix, you actually see that the salt begins to break the intramolecular force. It breaks the ionic bonds, break ionic, okay, bonds. And the water molecules begin to break their IMFs, or I should say separate slash weaken the IMFs between other water molecules, between other water. And then what we see is if you continue stirring, eventually the salt forms ion dipole, IMFs with the water. I am dipole with the water. And ion dipole is this weird mix of a charged portion with a polar portion, a half intra and a half inter that together form this weird inter molecular force that's based off of an actual bond being broken to form an interaction. But no new molecules made. So no new bond is made, just a new interaction from a broken bond. Yes. So, so like the sodium, when you dissolve sodium chloride in water, the sodium and chlorine separate. Right? Yes. Then why doesn't the sodium react with the water and let it flow? Because it's a That's charged it sodium. It's an ion. Remember, if you have an ion, you're still carrying that charge. Ionic compounds have a full transfer of electrons. So technically, they don't need each other. They've gotten their octet. But if you drop 
stable metal sodium with no charge, that's when it interacts. So the sodium from salt has like the electrons from chlorine mm -hmm. on it, so it's charged. Well, the so chlorine has the electrons from sodium. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it doesn't, so the sodium just doesn't react with the water as much. Yep. So the water then forms an ion dipole interaction with the individual ions. And this is what happens. When we see a charge, oh, that should be negative. When we see the interaction form, the water molecule will orient its dipole so that the more positive region of the polar molecule is closer to the negative ion and vice versa your positive cation that is now a free charged ion floating in water will arrange itself so it's more negative water oxygen portion is arranged around so it's closer, okay, to the positive cation. So they also are still keeping the idea that opposites attract. It's this weird dipole-dipole interaction from the breaking of an in molecular bond, an ionic compound. This is why salts dissolve. This is why you get electrocuted in water in the pool that's chlorinated. This is why, despite being super strong intramolecular forces for ionic compounds, they break so easily in water. Water is this really impressive molecular molecule that has the strength to break the intramolecular force of ionic compounds. Yes. So would you not get electrocuted in deionized water? You would not get electrocuted in deionized water. Exactly. Theoretically, unless they did a bad job. Okay. So something you should note is we call any solution, right? Don't forget any solution where water is the solvent. Whoa. Where water is solvent is aqueous. And we put this symbol. So you'll often find that ionic compounds are like, like CuSO4 AQ tells me that we've dissolved an ionic compound in water. We've separated its ions floating in a water solution. So what do you need to know? You should be able to use one, relatively rank the strength of intra versus inter. And of course these ion dipole forces are the weird bridge between. Big idea. Structure determines function. Now, the last thing I want to say is you're already noticing we're using a lot of pictures already in this unit. These are called particulate diagrams. They're a big theme on the AP exam, interpreting and drawing them. It's basically like a kid's illustration with a lot of thought behind it, okay? So for particulate diagrams, the big idea is that they show us what's happening at the particulate level. They show the particle level interactions. Hence the word particulate. So we can show type of matter. We can say, is it an element? Is it a compound? Is it an ion? Right, we can show that. We can show if it's a solid, the state of matter even, right? Looking at the pictures here, spreading more and more apart. We can show um, relative size. Am I working with a bigger or smaller atom or molecule? We can show if it's a pure or mixed substance. We can show how much volume it takes up due to the distance between the particles you draw. We can show the temperature, how fast it's moving, the relative kinetic energy, right? Vector motion. And we use arrows, or maybe we'll use this for vibration because molecules vibrate. Or maybe we'll even use long lines and how many lines. We can draw relative comparisons, right? Um, this is a big theme, is comparing. Theme, all right, here, I'll say relative comparison. I'm gonna say amount right, like molar ratio, okay? That's a great common relative comparison on top of all the other ones. So I'm gonna stop there and say, we're gonna warm up on Monday with the rest of the questions of interpreting particulate diagrams.
You guys will have a uh, video and I think one easy practice problem walkthrough. Really good job today. I know it was a push. Thanks for playing Red Rover with me.